we've been using the pandemic to try and, and innovate in the ways that we, we reach our community. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, may, maybe I can already start introducing Rodrigo very informally. Mm -hmm. Last year, I think in March or April, no, probably April, right? Yeah. Uh, the pandemic had started. We, we still didn't know how to deal with our students and how to deal with the things of teaching classes, um, well, let's say through a, a screen. Uh, and then uh, some of my students were, uh, well, they, they were doing some research on e-government and they came up with a paper by Rodrigo Sandoval. Uh, and then they said, oh, this is a cool paper, uh, uh, professor. Uh, let's discuss that in the next class. And I said, sure, but let's discuss it with the author. I had, I had not even talked to Rodrigo yet, but I knew that he's, he likes these crazy ideas. And then I just checked, is it okay next week or would it be better in two weeks from now? I, I gave him a little option, right? But he, was, he jumped in and, and he was really excited about the idea. Uh, it was that that's when I, I started thinking it, it was actually inviting Rodrigo for that class with, you know, it, it was a class with a, a small group of students. I think it was maybe some 15 students or so. But that made me realize that we could do could go much further than that. And in fact, I had not thought of that yet, Rodrigo, but I think you were the inspiration for the research seminars because we thought, uh, you know, I had never thought exactly. Of course, in, in La Caes, uh, the Latin American and Caribbean chapter of AI, the AIS, we have been discussing this possibility of doing things. See, Guillermo is there. He's going to he's check if the, 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 the other Mexican is around. <laughs> Hola, Rodrigo. Hola, Memo. Gusto verte. Igualmente. Muchas gracias. Un abrazo. And, and so, so we have been discussing that for, for quite a while and saying, gee, we have to join efforts somehow. And this is, this is the kind of attempt that we hope that in the future, I mean, we hope that in the future we'll have the, these research seminars and many others, and our students will jump from one to the other, and we'll be able to talk to all different professors from, from Latin America uh, and, and with other students. And uh, I mean, we will not feel so alone as we usually do being information systems uh, people in Latin America, many times either alone in a business school, as we were saying, or alone in, uh, in a computer science school trying to preach to people that do not necessarily understand what we're talking about. These guys, these people here, uh, they all uh, either understand us or want to understand what we talk about when we are talking about information. I just want to tell what we're going to be talking about today, uh, AI governance and development for the for, for public sector. Uh, Rodrigo has been uh, studying eGov for quite a while. In fact, uh, you will see that some of the papers that uh, were suggested here for reading uh, and, and some of the work that he does uh, is uh, together with, for example, Hugo Garcia that was with us last year, right? Uh, and, and then connects directly or indirectly to Mahima Kadar and all these other people that do uh, research in EGOV in, in Brazil. I don't know if, uh, if Aurora is here with us uh, today, but uh, in Chile and so on and so forth. So um, we'll have one of the specialists, our, one of our experts in EGOV to, to talk uh, about it with us today. One of the things uh, that I noticed uh, while I was thinking about a more formal introduction of Rodrigo is that he has a block. All right. It's a little outdated, uh, Rodrigo. The, I noticed that there are, there are things that are, you can include more information there, but there's a lot there. And uh, I spent some one hour at least uh, early, earlier this afternoon checking on things that he's been working on. Uh, and uh, so I think you will also have, for those of you who are interested in, in EGOP, a lot of ideas being shared here in, uh, in Rodrigo's blog, uh, some of his books uh, over here, uh, if I can click on it, and uh, some of his books. Well, one day he will tell us, he'll have to tell us about this Padre Divorciado here, uh, because that doesn't seem too much information systems or EGOV, but anyway. <laughs> so we have his books, uh, and uh, for you to, to know how focused he is on EGOV, I just brought here, G G he has uh, some uh, work like this, Government 2.0, that has been cited by 787 people. Uh, I wish one day I have one of my papers being cited by those many wow. people. I don't know if it will happen. Uh, it's something that for, for a Latin American, it's a dream. Uh, we, we, we see uh, the, that, that that happens more easily for people that write in English and, and, and all the time. Uh, but for us here, it is a, a challenge. And uh, well, Rodrigo is one of these guys who's, who's been able to do that. So, well, uh, congratulations for your journey, uh, Rodrigo. Uh, uh, we will, as I say, I, I will be allowing people in because there are still people coming uh, into our room, but maybe we should already give Rodrigo, the floor for his talk on AI. Uh, we're all very curious about it. Thank you very much for being with us, Rodrigo. Thanks a lot, Alexander. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. Hi, Marianne Macadar, and I see a lot of people that I, I know uh, from Brazil and from other Latin American countries. I am 
Well, I start my career as a researcher in AMSIS, and I have to move to the government, digital government society later on because, well, it was impossible to pay two conferences or three conferences a year. So, I mean, well, I, I, it's, um, it's a pity, but you have to choose in that way. Uh, so if we have enough uh, money to do that, well, I will be pleased, but you have to decide. Uh, so I think that one of the purposes of LACAIS was to share this knowledge between all of the researchers in information systems. Um, with Guillermo, we also talk a lot about how to share uh, teaching, uh, how to share these different methodologies. By the way, Guillermo was one of my uh, persons of my committee for my dissertation. He, he is the one that is guilty that I am a PhD. And I, I'm the only one that voted against. <laughs> And thanks a lot, Memo, for your for your support. And when we were working together at the Tecnológico de Monterrey, uh, long, long time ago, because Memo moves from one place to another, now he's in the States. I don't know why, but I try to realize why <laughs> with the president in Mexico. So if I can there do that, no the reasons, same, right? No, everything is good. If I, if, I, if I can do the same, I will do it, but my family will blame me for that. Well, anyway, uh, um, I want to share with you my research, my recent research. I have been focusing in uh, artificial intelligence in a couple of years. Uh, so um, I want to share some ideas and maybe we can talk a little bit. I try to do my best to summarize and to do this, but maybe I think a lot of things maybe are going to be, uh, well, just, well, let's let's go into it. Um, I, I, I want to share my screen, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I cannot see you anymore. So, well, um, please let me know if, if this is okay, if you see my my screen. Yes, it's working. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be on the bl blind side there, but we are all paying attention to you. <laughs> all right, all right. So, uh, well, we can talk a little bit at the end, and maybe if I have some doubts, I will jump into that doubt right now. So, um, well, I, I try to understand uh, this problem uh, with these initial thoughts. And I think that uh, the artificial intelligence right now is something that is emerging in the public sector. Uh, I mean, it's emerging already in the private sector uh, and the industry of artificial intelligence is changing. But in the public sector is a game changer. I think so, and it's something that we have to deal with this kind of change. Secondly, uh, well, the idea of this kind of research is how to understand, to control and to promote at the same time, all of these three things, the use of artificial intelligence in the government. So this is uh, the main ideas or the main questions that are going to lead this uh, small talk. Um, I want to uh, talk about these four, five uh, steps of this presentation. One, I, I try to title as a location. I, I, I'm not sure that is the correct title, but my English is a little bit rusty because I have not been in the conferences in the past year. So please forgive me if I do a, any mistake in my English speaking. Um, and well, the next step will be forthcoming problems. What is AI governance? Uh, research paths that I identify. Maybe I miss some, but I try. And I will finish with my three preliminary notes of what I think, uh, what I'm thinking right now and what I'm doing. So where we are in artificial intelligence, and that's important because we need to focus. Maybe this is a little bit conceptual and maybe some of you know, but let's try to uh, establish a common floor of uh, concepts. Uh, the first one is that uh, we, we have this evolution of artificial intelligence as we know as narrow artificial intelligence. And this is something for uh, a specific task. We use the artificial intelligence different aspects, methodologies, I mean, tools, I can see like uh, machine learning or expert systems or um, genetic algorithms or something like that related to cognitive abilities uh, in order to perform certain tasks. And those tasks are pre precisely what we have right now. Um, we have the idea that Google and Tesla are developing self-driving cars. We have right now facial recognition tools. Uh, Facebook has a 
example, uh, an example of this, but it's also in the many, many cell phones. I mean, Apple is not the only one. I mean, you have fa uh, facial recognition in many others. Um, we have some customer service bots. I mean, in Mexico, it's very common to to talk to a Telcel or to Telmex, and you have some bots of uh, of them. Uh, the next technology that uses this more frequently is Google page websites. But I think that uh, this is um, already past. I mean, we have a lot of artificial intelligence when we Google, and at the same time, we use Facebook. And we use an intelligence, uh, an intelligent uh, speaker, and we are uh, speaking with my wife about, I don't know, toys for the kids. And suddenly, in Facebook, appears the toys for the kids that we are talking about, and then in Gmail appears the same toys or the same advertisements that refers to that. So, those are uh, results of different kinds of algorithms that recognize or uh, or. or, or or talking or speaking, and they are um, trying to include in the different uh, uh, publication or different channels of publications. Um, this is also in the shopping cart. This is also in the different filters. The, and this is, of course, part of the problem. But we are right now in the narrow uh, artificial intelligence. This is what we have right now. This is the stage that we have more development, and we are still developing a lot of tools using narrow artificial intelligence. The second step is the general artificial intelligence that is well known as a strong AI. And this is more complex, and this is tried to be like the mirror of a human intelligence. And we want to be uh, like that. The problem of general artificial intelligence is that it has a lot of myths a lot of misconceptions and, of course, a lot of problems because it's related completely to Hollywood movies, to TV series, to soap operas, and we understand this as, as a threat. Uh, I mean, uh, strong artificial intelligence is understand like Minority Report movie of uh, Tom Cruise. Do you remember this? It's, it's a very um, common example. But we also understand this like a, a Terminator or something like that. So the, the, the fear of artificial intelligence is based in one part, we are going to see the next one, in the strong AI. The best examples, of course, again, is science fiction. Uh, and well, the best examples are Jarvis, this computer of Iron Man, and R2-D2 from Star Wars. I mean, I know that Memo has a lot of R2-D2s in the, his desk and in his life. So, I, I mean, it's one of the things that we want at the end. Uh, I mean, it's something that we aspire when we talk about artificial intelligence. But we are not there. We are looking uh, to that direction, but actually we are not there. We are far away from there. I mean, far away could be 20 years from now, but uh, we are still far away. Uh, well, the, the challenge to be there is not only language processing, computer vision, and all of that, is the whole brain emulation. I mean, to try to make that the machines, any kind of machine, will think the same or as similar as the human brain can be in all aspects, in memory, in decision making, in learning behaviors, and all of that. And that's the challenge, because we, we're not, uh, we don't have the, uh, the processor power to do that, and we don't have the technology, the software right now, to run that kind of, of processing. Uh, we are thinking, we, we are thinking in that way, but we are doing that. Uh, well, the, the best examples and the best tools are machine learning and deep learning, uh, that we are trying to make these machines available for all of this uh, goal. But uh, we, are, we are thinking on that. I mean, in, in the case of Latin America, I believe that we are uh, left behind and we need to go in, in a very hard way to do that because we don't have enough support from the government. We don't have the budget to do research with all of that. Uh, in Europe and specifically in Asia with China, Singapore, I mean, this is overwhelming. I mean, people are looking in that direction, are thinking, and are developing a lot of uh, research and 
uh, new uh, innovations and new things using these two tools from artificial intelligence uh, with a lot of support from the industry and the governments and we are uh, we, we were in, in the we're thinking very very slow or we are reacting in a different way uh, for achieving the goals of the uh, strong AI uh, well we have uh, some concepts here about deep learning machine uh, is a subset of machine learning and machine learning well is it learns from unsupervised and unstructured data and is processing as a neural networks um, well actually it's like the human brain we uh, process a lot of data from the news from the people from the comments from the social media and we integrate that information inside our brains and we learn about that kind of process so the research process on machine learning and these learning uh, skills uh, well is a transition that we are developing from the uh, artificial i mean this any first step to the strong artificial intelligence this narrow artificial intelligence to uh, more uh, robust uh, intelligence in in this way so the the third stage is the one that is called artificial super intelligence and this is uh, something that exceeds the human capabilities and uh, what we can say operates as a genius level because the computers can repair themselves can do things by themselves can learn can develop new computers um, and well also nanotechnology uh, so maybe well i think somebody else but not me uh, maybe that th is going to be the next uh, generation or two or three generations when, when ma humankind uh, reach the space that we can have this kind of super intelligence uh, artificial super intelligence but in this generation i see very very far away from that so those are the the locations the three locations the three different stages uh, we are in the first one uh, in the preliminary stage and we are going forward to achieve the next one, the strong AI, and we are very far away to reach the super intelligence right now. Um, well, um, according to these ideas, where we are in, in terms of uh, the context, uh, well, the thing is that we have a lot of uh, data right now. We have millions and millions of records that are collected by Google, by Amazon, by whatever you want. Um, those records are being used to develop uh, new artificial intelligence uh, ideas or new innovations. Um, we also have the infrastructure. We have developed uh, more processing power than 10 years ago. Um, and this sum of a lot of records to research and uh, the infrastructure is what leads us to artificial intelligence, to use artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence cannot work without these uh, two uh, primary conditions. The first primary condition is to have a lot of data to being exploited. And the second is how to exploit that data with infrastructure, algorithms, uh, computer power, and all of that. So this combination is what creates artificial intelligence. And right now we have a, we, we produce a lot of data and are collected in several forms. And the industry has developed uh, some um, processing power that is not at the reach of every human being. I mean, this is only processing power like quantum processors or something like that, just for, for high developed countries and high budgets of money in Amazon or money from Apple or money for China, uh, I think. The second part of this context is the different development of, robot, of, of robots. Uh, these uh, robots are starting with the bots. And the bots are this small software to uh, have some particular uh, goal or particular task to understand the customer service, to provide some ideas, advices, 
or to provide just links to direct to some place. The other part is the, the, the robots, uh, as we know, you know, these machines, these human robots that uh, are similar. And, and this is tricky and this is very complex because it's very difficult to have a robot that reach one thing uh, with the hand and to manipulate this thing with the hand. Uh, this is difficult to develop. And if we want that these processes has to be developed uh, automatically and the same robot learn by themselves how to do all of these process or learning process. I mean, we are not in that stage. Um, I don't know if, if you know this small robot that is Roomba that is sweeping the floor. Uh, well, the, the Roombas are uh, dumb robots, I can say, uh, because uh, they, they have some different, um, I, I, I don't remember the word exactly, in English, uh, sensors uh, to uh, tell them how is the floor, how is the things and all of that. But they don't, I mean, they usually learn a map. I mean, they try to map uh, a house, but that's all. I mean, they cannot have the power uh, to make decisions for doing something else yet. Uh, but we are still in that way. Um, however, uh, for example, in Japan, there are a lot of robots that are being used for um, helping the uh, elderly people. There are some hotels that are running by robots. Uh, these hotels are uh, also part of a, a chain or chains that uh, they, they, they want to reduce costs, so they prefer to hire some robots and they uh, do all the things that, I mean, this is a, we're talking about a hotel that it's with two or three human beings and the rest are robots that are doing the, all the tasks from the hotel. The third part of the context is these uh, pandemics and the COVID-19 uh, causes a synergy of different changes in many aspects of technology. One of the aspects, of course, is the artificial intelligence. Uh, and we can expect that artificial intelligence will be, will be the game changer of the pandemics and produce that. But, uh, well, there are, uh, is, uh, there are two sides of the coin. I mean, the first is that, yes, there are some advances produced by artificial intelligence, like robots at the front desk of the hospitals that take the temperature, that provides some medicines to the people inside the hospital and do not risk the human being. They function like nurseries. We have robots that, of uh, Boston Dynamics in the parks that are alerting people that uh, to have a, a distance between them or to go to their houses. But that's all. I mean, the other um, uh, processes, I mean, the MIT Technology Review uh, write a, a paper a few weeks ago in which they said that they have a lot of mistakes or a, a lot of problems using AI technologies to develop some of the uh, of the of the different aspects uh, to help uh, to reduce the pandemics. And well, I mean, of course, there are parts of the artificial intelligence that are not completely tested or proved right now. And so we have these two parts. Um, the last part of my context is that COVID-19 alters the processes in government and citizens. And this is, uh, well, uh, this is overwhelming for many governments because they want to continue with the same idea, with the same processes as before the pandemics. But this is uh, impossible because citizens are changing and the government is also changing. Government realizes in many aspects that the people uh, now has another possibility to, to share information, to pay taxes, to access the public services. So this is changing the structure of the government um, and because the claims and the needs of the people is completely different from it was uh, a couple of months, well, a couple of years ago. Um, and where we can talk a lot about uh, all of these processes that are being altered, but this is not the part that I want to focus my presentation. Um, so according to this context, uh, we can see some problems. We can identify these problems. Uh, on my view, 
one of the main problems that is caused by the artificial intelligence is the massive surveillance. I mean, in order to reduce the contagious of the people and the diffusion of the viruses, the massive surveillance that uses a lot of technology from artificial intelligence is on the place. So we are now more, uh, I mean, we have a vigilant eye in every aspect of our lives, uh, and the excuse is the COVID-19. Um, uh, we, we, for example, I mean, uh, the case of, Polo of Poland, uh, for me, is is very revealing because on Poland you uh, must uh, send a message inside your house uh, with your phone to the government to say that you are inside your house and you are not moving there. Um, and and this is uh, important because well the 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 cell phone has this location uh, is a locator uh, GPS. Um, that it matches with the picture, and this is face recognition of the people, and it matches with the records that say that you are the person that owns that telephone, that lives in that address, and that you are in a specific location at a specific time, uh, in order to control the people. So this control has not limits, has not boundaries, and the excuse is artificial intelligence. So this is one of the problems. The other problems is uh, development problems. I mean, we have a lot of uh, different levels of use of technology that uses artificial intelligence in Asia, uh, let's say Singapore, Malaysia, there is people that is doing uh, that they, I mean, I, I wrote a paper, well, not, it's not a paper, it's a small story about how the, the kids go to the school in those countries, and those kids are goes to the school because they are vaccinated and they send their vaccine through their cellular phone of their parents, and their parents um, link this cellular phone with the records of the government agency that is related. So when they arrive to the school, they have to show the QR code and that QR code means that the kid is healthy and is vaccinated or it has no viruses. So that is happening in, in, in Singapore, that is happening in Malaysia, that is happening in all of these countries. And in Mexico, we, uh, we came back to the school last week and now there are 39 schools that are closed in my city because they have contagious and there are nothing to reduce that. So we have a different degrees of um, of technology to solve the problems. And of course, China is developing a lot of uh, research of artificial intelligence strategies, and also some countries in Europe, like Estonia or like, uh, uh, well, Germany, as a fact, uh, they are doing all of this, um, and we don't. I mean, we, we are not looking and we are not developing ideas in that uh, sense. So, this presents a lot of development problems that we need to address. Uh, the third problem is, of course, the environmental problems, and this uh, climate change is producing another problems like uh, heavy rains or all of that. And we have a lot of technology, artificial intelligence technologies, that are uh, used to uh, forecast or to predict some of these changes, and we don't know how to use it. Um, Besides that, we have the problem of the environment that is produced by all the, the machines, the computers, the, uh, all of this, and uh, is created these environmental problems without uh, knowledge. And of course, these environmental problems is also affecting for the development of new viruses or new health problems. Well, the other one is the wicked problems. We have already some wicked problems. I don't know if you are familiarized with this concept, but the wicked problems are multi-factor problems that are already in place. I mean, like poverty is one wicked problem. Uh, of course, the climate change is another one. The government's uh, public uh, services in some locations are wicked problems because if they provide the service, they are causing some other reactions or effects in the population. Whatever. So the, the wicked problems are expanding also with artificial intelligence. And why? Because artificial intelligence is trying, well, it's not trying, but it's in, in the fact that it's causing um, um, inequality 
on the use of information and on equality on the access of new technologies. Uh, and this is this is something that is key to understand. And, and well, maybe we cannot imagine this at this moment because uh, we are aware that many people, I don't know how, uh, what is the number of, of Brazilians with a cell phone, but in Mexico it's something like around, uh, I mean, we are like 127 millions of Mexicans and we have something like 200 millions of cell phones. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, Rodrigo. It's probably tw twice as many. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. So, 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 well, I mean, we think that with the people use of technology, I mean, it's, uh, it's good, it's cool. I mean, we don't have problems and we can see that people has technology. But the problem is that that technology that we have access right now is a very, very reduced um, use of technology in comparison what we can do with artificial intelligence. Uh, let's let's give you a small example. Uh, I mean, in China, there is a company that uh, gives credits to their users uh, just with a, I mean, uh, just with a phone. Uh, I mean, they can ask for the credit using their cell phone. And these people see, I mean, analyze uh, to which people, to which clients provide the credit with some factors. One of these factors is the level of the battery of their cell phones. Because they use an algorithm with millions of records to understand that if the level of use of the battery of the phone is high, I mean, if you have a full charge battery, it means that you are reliable and that's why they can give you a loan. No problem. But I think I would be very unreliable then, Rodrigo, <laughs> because mine is always with a flat battery. <laughs> yeah, but people with, with low battery is people unreliable, according to this, at least in the Chinese spectrum. So um, we are not using, I mean, the technology as, as we know, and, and this is cause an unequal and uneven use of the, of the different aspects of technology. Uh, the other problem, of course, is the health problems, uh, the virus contention. I don't want to talk about this. We have a lot of information about this. Uh, but, well, of course, the artificial intelligence uh, use of algorithms and forecasting for all of this is, is over there. Uh, finally, and not final, because we can have a lot of problems, but is one of this is a regulatory framework of the different data ecosystems. And this is uh, important because um, one of the key elements of the new economy is the data. And the data is the primary subject for any artificial intelligence adventure, any. So if we have a lot of data, a lot of records, we can do some artificial intelligence uh, advances or we can use for uh, to learn the computers to do something else. But if we don't create these uh, data ecosystems, that are reliable, that are data ecosystems that are part of a framework, a national framework that standardizes the data, that creates, and regulates, and protects the different data. Uh, we don't have access to, to all of that. So in order to solve these problems, well, it's, it's easy. We need to uh, jump into the artificial intelligence technologies. We need that machines learn by themselves fast, we need to create some expert systems to do forecasting, to discover new trends, to categorize and classify, to provide some solutions with multiple information sources and to help the, the people and, and to, to understand how, how they, this is going to change their lives. This is going to change their, their works, their different uh, roles in the society and the different roles with the artificial intelligence. If we develop artificial intelligence in robots, in software, we will need people to give maintenance to those software, to those robots, and we need people prepared to do so. Uh, and also we need people to regulate or to understand the relationship between these new kind of machines that interact with us and the society itself. Uh, so, well, the first question is already, uh, what is the, the model that we must follow to develop artificial intelligence solutions? What is the correct model? What is the correct idea? What, what, what is the, this thing? 
Uh, another question is how open can we leave the artificial intelligence development industry? I mean, that it, it's going to be wild without regulations, without limitations. I mean, you have to promote that everybody in Mexico, in Brazil, in China, in the US, and the industry uh, rises uh, like a superpower and all of that. I don't know. Uh, but our question is, how can we determine or define the human relation with machines? I mean, we, we can see this in the movies, I know, but the movies are not a reality. I mean, we are dealing with this right now. I don't know if you know this software, new software that it calls note-taking software, that is something like a fashion. There is something that we call Rome, this is a very popular one, uh, but there is another one that it calls Log, Sec, and there is another one that calls Mem, you know, and there are plenty, like 10. Well, I have tried it all, but I realized that they are changing the way that I think, the way that I take notes online, the way that I uh, understand the reality, using that to focus my mind in some kinds of ideas. Uh, so we are now having this relationship with machines and how can we use that relationship? Or kids that are having classes online, they are using the relationship with machines. They are related more with machines rather than with another students. And finally, another question is what roles do we have as a human being in front of a robot in any kind of uh, stage that we were in super intelligence or in strong uh, artificial intelligence. So all of this is just to arrive to this idea of governance. And uh, What is artificial intelligence governance? Well, the, the governance concept as the UN mentioned is something that many individuals, uh, institutions manage in a continuing processes through different interests. I mean, it's something that we can do in order that we can uh, organize ourselves to do something else. It's something that regulates uh, self-regulation, we can understand. It's like governing ourselves. I don't know if that exists in English, but I try to do it. So there is no uh, concept, an absolute concept of AI governance so far. That's one of the things that we have to figure it out. But um, the questions that can lead us to a concept is how to control, to regulate, to promote the development of AI in the government. Simultaneously, these three things, control, regulate, and promote, and to try to start this artificial intelligence so far. And secondly, is how to coordinate the strategies of artificial intelligence, the efforts, how to coordinate the industries in order to avoid a monopolistic practices. Uh, and this is key. Why I, I, I want to, to share with you this, and this is important because we cannot, uh, I mean, right now we have a lot of um, cars in streets, but some years ago, I mean, 200 years ago, when, Hoff, when Ford Motor Company starts with the first G car, uh, I mean, they were in the monopoly of the cars. And they were using all of these engines and um, infrastructure and all of that to produce these cars. The same could apply uh, right now with artificial intelligence. If we allow that one country could be China, could be Russia, could be US, could be Singapore, uh, could be Canada, I don't know, could be European community. If we let that one country monopolize artificial intelligence developments or robots or algorithms, we will have very, very, very big problems. I mean, Skynet from Terminator will be different. <laughs> will be something for kids if we are talking that china has the the rule of all the development of artificial intelligence so what are the research paths first research path uh, try to define uh, artificial intelligence governance as a global goal to to understand that well we have a lot of people some scholars that are thinking about this and they are proposing a lot of frameworks uh, a lot of uh, different stages. We're going to see one at the end of this presentation. 
uh, well, this is this is huge in order that we can to understand this and provide some solutions to the decision makers, the politicians, or the governments. The second research part is the algorithmic governance, and this idea is is very powerful because uh, if we think artificial intelligence as the heart or the blood of artificial intelligence are the algorithms that are made by the humans and the algorithms that we're developing, well, we need to govern, to rule the algorithms. We need to make that the algorithms become, become uh, like an open source, like an open quest, in order that everybody can have access to the algorithms and can publish and can create new things and can rule things. Of course, I, I'm saying something that for, for many of you maybe is, is not good because the algorithm is the key to make money. And, and that's real, but sometimes the algorithm uh, is the key to enter university, or sometimes the algorithm is the key to being arrested by facial recognition. So if you go to, I mean, there, there is a very documented uh, um, example in Argentina when they start with facial recognition cameras, and they arrested a, a man that is, it was presently a criminal, and after a week of being in jail, they realized that it was not this guy, that the computers and the algorithm has made a mistake comparing this man with the real criminal. Same thing happens in, in, in Great Britain in a similar experiment. Uh, another example about algorithmic governance is, is this idea of that some universities like Australia, like US and some in Canada are using algorithms to um, to accept or to deny scholars to be in a university because the, algor the algorithms uh, calculates the average about all their previous uh, history as a scholar, uh, I mean, as a student, and uh, they say, well, this person is not reliable and this person has not to be in a university, so why we have to spend money in this, in this guy or in this person, so don't let him to be in the university. So algorithms are key in that way. So another research part is about machine learning. Uh, and well, this specific tool from um, artificial intelligence has to be some kind of boundaries. Maybe not the, I mean, the, the tool itself or the technical aspects as the results that are produced by machine learning. And, and we can do the same with other um, tools from artificial intelligence. But I choose this particularly because it's the one that is right now more in the narrow artificial intelligence. So we can see this like a, a first step to try to place some boundaries, some limitations, or to start thinking how to rule the use of machine learning. Of course, the other one is robotics. I mean, robotics, it has a lot of things to, to, to understand. Uh, the first one is what are the stakes? How, um, how, how, I don't know, how long or how, how far can we leave that the robots advance in the following years? I mean, are we allowing to think that a robot can have the power to rule a nation? I mean, in Japan, I mean, four or five years ago, there was an election and people from one city, I, I think it's Osaka, they um, present a robot as a major. And, of, and well, unfortunately, the robot has the third place. <laughs> but many people vote for the robot because they are very difficult to cheat. They are very difficult to rest. They don't take vacations. They work 24-7, 365 days. They calculate everything. So it's a very good politician. I mean, well, it's a very good public official. So uh, can we do that? I mean, we, we are allowing to do that robots take those kind of positions. Uh, and what is going to be the relationship with the robots? I mean, we, we can provide a teacher that has become a robot and it has only the, the goal that everybody learns, but in that learning process it has many steps. Uh, so are we, sh we are sure to provide those robots the skills and the ability to go inside of relations and to educate our kids? Uh, I'm not sure. And how about the development? Who is going to be the the best robot maker in the world. China is going to be Japan, is going to be Mexico, 
and who are going to give maintenance to these robots. Uh, another research part that is uh, important and is right now in, in, in discussion is that this kind of e-justice. And uh, that, that is important because we have right now the technology to parse all of legal documents and a robot or a boat to provide some results about this. I mean, Estonia has developed this e-judge that uh, gives you a solution of cases that are uh, uh, below, I, I think, 1,000 euros or something like that. Um, there is another uh, robot or another development in Argentina made by one of the colleagues that is Elsa Esteves and some of the research work, and they reduce the paperwork of the judges from several days to hours. I mean, because they have the technology and they develop the algorithm, algorithm to parsing all of these documents, legal documents, and to provide a decision. And this is just the first step. So what, what is going to be the next path? What is going to be, at, at what point do we are going to arrive? What, what is the limit for uh, allowing to provide or to create some algorithms in this uh, direction? Um, so my, my three final notes, and this is preliminary notes that we are doing right now, is that, well, the first thing that we, we need to consider is that it's important to define the different boundaries of governance on artificial intelligence. At what aspect do we want to, to create a framework, to create um, a common rules, to create uh, uh, limits? So we, we need to understand this problem and to develop in accordingly uh, in order that we can provide some solutions to the decision makers or to the industry in order that we don't have surprises in the short term. Uh, and we can balance the different uh, advantages the, and disadvantages, the risks and the problems that we have with uh, artificial intelligence. And we are thinking about this. I'm thinking a lot about how to do this. Um, if, if it is true that we can go, that we can create a framework of governance. Um, right now, the countries are in the stage to develop general strategies to achieve common goals of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, but they are not thinking about how to regulate the artificial intelligence when it's already working in their countries. So, well, part of this research is to do that. The second part, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is the, this idea of algorithmic government. So, the, the first step is to define if we want that uh, algorithms rules public decision, if we want that algorithms create uh, policy making. Uh, I have a paper that I, I don't remember if I shared with you, but this is a paper of, of public policy and uh, well we develop a model of uh, the how to develop public policies with artificial intelligence and in this paper the main idea is that the different the four processes Rodrigo, of, is that the one on uh, assessing the public uh, policy cycle framework in the yes. age of artificial intelligence yes it's there people can check it on on moodle yeah. mm -hmm. yes yes thank you very much alexander Where i don't is? know how, how, how where, where is my head? I don't remember the, the titles of my papers, but well, it's part of the age, I think. That's why I need a second break. <laughs> well, the thing is uh, that uh, with this paper, we... That's because we don't read our own papers, Rodrigo. So. <laughs> yes, my mom. Thank you. Thank you. you. You are my master. That's why you were in my committee for, the, for, my, uh, present, for my dissertation. Uh, the, the idea here is that the different processes uh, the different stages from public policy are uh, impact by artificial intelligence. For example, agenda setting is the first um, step of public policy. And we propose that artificial intelligence can develop, uh, can analyze the different ways of uh, uh, forecast the problems of the public uh, problems or the public needs. So they can, in advance, provide solutions and to establish some points of the agenda setting. Instead of being waiting for the people to take the streets and to place a demand, 
we think that uh, the artificial intelligence with all the records with all the previous knowledge from the government decision making from all the from all the data that is around a country or a neighborhood can provide a better and a more specific uh, point uh, from the agenda uh, but this is part of the of the problem so if we want to decide that algorithms will rule the government, those algorithms uh, can have some kind of boundaries. Uh, they are going to be open, they are going to be closed by national security and nobody else can see them. Uh, how can we define this relationship of the algorithms and the government? Um, and the third one is these models of governance. Uh, for example, Goyman, uh, that, um, I'm sorry, I forget to place here the reference, but Coinman uh, presents this model that I, I like a lot. And he established that three different uh, types of governance for uh, other things, but I think that are applicable to artificial intelligence. And this uh, scholar says that the first one is the hierarchical governance, in which uh, the governing is superimposed upon those govern and this hierarchical governance could be one stage of artificial intelligence that we can uh, start i mean that we can rule artificial intelligence using hierarchical in a first place then when we learn when, when artificial intelligence goes well well the second model could be self-governance in which all the actors and the societal uh try to combine resources and to establish some ideas of common purpose and they can by themselves uh, some kind of governance and the final stage is the co-governance with more mature with a different perspective we can have that everybody has a share a common purpose and they can co-govern it by themselves so this idea to um, develop some models of governance is another part of my research another part of that we are thinking which model will be the best one that includes this part and uh, i left behind some of, of, of the problems that some key problems one of these key problems is the ethical part how ethics is imposed in the development of algorithms development of governance uh, is one part and the other part is ethics for the computers, ethics for the artificial intelligence. Can we think that a computer, a super intelligence computer has some kind of ethics? I mean, uh, this is this is one of the problems that I left from this presentation, but is, is, is key problem in the long term. So that's all that I have to share. Uh, I know that I have more doubts than um, answers, but well, the purpose of this talks I, as, as i recall it was one of these idea to be in the in the edge of what we are doing as, a, as a scholars and to provide some new insights for your research or for your investigations i don't know if if, if that is what you have in mind uh, but well i'm be happy to discuss some of these ideas and to share with you what we have so far so thank you very much for your attention if you are still there uh, well, I, yes, I can assure you that there's still, still a lot of us here. Oh, um, I, I would say that all of us, uh, was, sometimes people have some technical problems, they jump out and they come back in, but uh, you kept the audience for the, the whole time. Uh, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. It seems that, well, Guillermo has uh, already opened his camera there it's for clapping. Okay, we do that, but I, I thought that Guillermo already had uh, the first question. No, I think Violeta does. <laughs> Who is it? Oh, Violeta does. Okay. Well, I didn't raise my hands, but... I'm very glad to meet Rodrigo, finally. Thank you, Rodrigo, for uh, following me on Semiagi. <laughs> and I would like just to put some more um, ingredients in the questions. Uh, right now, we are, I'm working with a student uh, on blockchain technology, blockchain technology in, yeah. in healthcare. And uh, one of the problems is exactly the problems of uh, uh, data uh, security, because it's a... Uh, sensible data and uh and one thing i was i think is was interesting was what you brought about the models of governance because uh we have the the problem of boundaries what is public and what is private yes so this is very hard to 
you know, to, to define because we don't know anymore what is what is really private because I, it, it seems that uh, once you are on the net, you have no private uh, information anymore, yes. And uh, what we are struggling is uh, on, uh, we are trying to work on uh, data governance on which data should go on blockchain and how should it be shared. And I think there is a close connection with uh, government, yes, uh, especially when we are dealing with health data. What data should be shared, what data cannot be shared, what data can be used for research, for example. And I, I'm just sharing some more questions, okay? And thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, yes, and one more ingredient, I think, is um, there's a group researching um, smart toys. And one problem with smart toys is, I was thinking now, uh, we don't know anymore the limit of what it, the definition, what really is a, a toy anymore, yes? Because some toys are are used for so many other things. Uh, we can, for example, Minecraft is, is a toy, but it's been used at school very much, yes? And uh, and one problem that they, they had raised is the, also the security, because kids, they stress so much on their toys, and sometimes these toys come in the, in the form of a, a teddy bear or something like that, and they share very um, personal information. They even try to make it an experiment, and they ask the, the, the kid to go to his um, mother's uh, purse and get her, her credit card, and he, he told the teddy bear the number of her mother's credit card. So it, it's very hard to, to um, I don't know, to keep the security in, in, and the boundaries of how you, you keep data safe, yes? Well, that, that was just some more things to, to think about. Thank you again, Rodrigo. <laughs> Alexander, how, how will you do this? I mean, just... Uh, well, you, you, you can just respond to her. Okay, we're very chaotic with respect to that, right? So if anyone wants to jump in, but of course we want to hear a lot of uh, when people say something, if you have your own response. I mean, you're, you're our special expert of the day, right? <laughs> Ah, well, thank you very much. Um, um, thank you, Violeta, for your uh, remarks and your comments. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, blockchain. I have some Bitcoins of myself. Uh, well, not so big, it's just a very small piece of Bitcoin because they're very expensive. But uh, blockchain is another technology that is uh, going to be side by side by artificial intelligence. I think that in one point they are going to be combined with an uh, extraordinary potential. And that actually there is a, uh, this idea of mining using artificial intelligence is, is part of that. Uh, so I think that is, is important. The other thing is that what is public and what is private is very important. I think that is this is one of the problems of the ma massive surveillance and the problems that we have right now because we open all the data for artificial intelligence and we don't know uh, where this data goes and how they are going to do that and what are they going to do with my data so far so this is this is precisely part of the research that we are doing to, to try to understand the problem and to figure it out how to solve it just with a framework or with something else uh well marianne macadare was uh, rising hi marie Hi, Rodrigo. Nice to see you. A uh, long time that we don't meet. Uh, well, I uh, thank you very much for, for, for your speech. It was very interesting that, to know that you are researching this area right now and how interesting is your question that you share with us. And I was thinking here, trying to, not to answer, but try reflecting on, on your questions and, and yeah. So I was thinking that um, why we really need a, um, a specific regulation for um, AI, governance AI. Why we really need a, a, a governance AI. Why we don't need an uh, uh, a ICT governance as, as a general for public sector that includes uh, IoT, uh, blockchain, whatever, any other technologies that probably we, we arrive in the next few years and I don't know how many years, but uh, so because probably most of these um, um, problems that we are facing right now, security, those that Violeta mentioned right now, are it will be similar. So probably a broad, I don't know, if you want to talk about framework, a governance framework or something that includes uh, all these you know, new technology that probably will arise in the next few years uh, and, you know, try to understand and to 
you know, to uh, think on the governance of, as at all as a public sector. And perhaps, like Violeta said, uh, not a specific public sector because the boundaries are so, you know, uh, yeah, not, not, not exactly. No. So, yeah. I, I just some some questions that came on my mind when you were th talking about this, the need of a specific uh, governance to AI. I really, I'm not sure if we really need for a specific AI or if for a, a general, it will be useful. I don't know. Just... Well, thanks a lot for your your question, Marian. It's a it's a very interesting question. Um, well, there are uh, a few ideas. Uh, the first one is that with the other technologies like IoT or like uh, Internet of the Things and all of that, they arrive suddenly. <laughs> and they arrive just without notice and without letting us know how they are going to affect our lives and what is going to happen with that. Uh, and the, uh, is, this is a difference with artificial intelligence because the um, artificial intelligence is, is give us a little time because the development is not so fast because we yeah. need to develop more processing power, more data in order to learn the computers and to this use machine learning and to become some uh, uh, algorithms and all of that. Uh, artificial intelligence is providing us a little space of time so we can think about how to regulate that. And the other idea is that for the impact. I mean, as you well know, uh, IoT, for example, the impact, many people think that the impact will be uh, astonishing and from one day to the other, we will have computers and uh, washing machines and all of that uh, controlled by that. And well, the industry has not <laughs> achieved until that. And the people is not buying completely all of these devices with uh, technology, including. Uh, so the, the change is not there, I mean, so far. Same thing occurs, uh, a different things occurs with artificial intelligence. I mean, artificial intelligence is already in our cell phones. I mean, we have the cell phone with uh, face recognition, with uh, machine recognition, or, uh, I'm sorry, with, uh, with language recognition. I mean, I can dictate, and there is no mistakes here. 10 years ago, I can dictate to the same phone and there was a plenty of mistakes. And now I can have a face recognition without mistakes, even at night. So artificial intelligence is changing more. Uh, the impact of artificial intelligence in our lives is, is as I mentioned, a game changer. And specifically in uh, government, I think that we need to try to regulate. I mean, we, we don't regulate, or we barely regulate open data, for example, or data. I mean, and it takes us a lot of, a lot of effort and a lot of things to try to government in the first place to uh, start a digital transformation. I mean, to reduce the paperwork and to go to the digital work. And the second is to how to deal with that, how do they struggle with that? I mean, they don't want to open the data. They don't want to share the data. The data on the government sometimes is uh, wrong. So. Try to not make the same mistake with artificial intelligence. Try to provide something at the first term, uh, term and to try to provide beforehand the, the things happen. That, that's the, the idea. And, and we have a little time because in order that we have to arrive to the super artificial intelligence, I mean, it takes us one century or more. I don't know. So that's my, my answer. Rodrigo, uh, I, I don't know, I had the impression that, and maybe only my impression, that the slide that you spent more time was the slide on problems. And before you got to the slide on problems, you had already mentioned, uh, well, the, what was that? The Tom Cruise, uh, what was the, the name of the Minority Report. Minority Report. And you had already prepared us for the problems. And then after going through the slides with problems, you kept talking about problems as well. Uh, and, and I think that that's probably, it may have been my perception because uh, some of your, your writing also shows uh, the, the good points of, uh, of, of those uh, technologies. But I, I have this feeling that uh, if we think from, I mean, e-government has provided us uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so, it has provided us with a lot of more service than in the past, right? Uh, and it seems from your, your, your speech that um, AI will also provide a lot of service. I mean, if people are start, starting to think about electing a robot, their mayor, right? That means that they think that well, service is going to be provided and it's going to be reliable service. 
But then things, I mean, what comes to my mind is control, surveillance, uh, or just service, but never citizenship. Uh, do you see any room for uh, AI to help provide us with more citizenship in the future? Uh, can we, I mean, can, is there a, a bright side to the discussion of AI in e-government? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry <laughs> if I, I, I'm not balanced the presentation. Then I, I found right now more problems. I identify more problems. I wish to have more solutions, more insights. I'm thinking about that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for your question, the answer is no. I mean, I don't. If this goes in that way, I mean, citizenship will be very limited. I mean, citizen using technology it will be very limited. As a matter of fact, there is uh, a research line uh, that mentions that uh, computers will um, forecast how the people is going to behave in democratic terms. And with all of this scandal of Cambridge Analytica and all of this scandal of the Capitol Hill taking by Donald Trump at the beginning of this, of this year, using social media to promote and to control the people's, uh, all of that, I mean, th that's, that's a path of research. That, that is a stream of, of, of strong research. Um, I have been doing research of sentiment analysis for Twitter and Facebook for so long, I mean, four or five years, and uh, we have several papers about this, and we find out that, of course, there is there is a strong correlation in that direction, that people is considering more uh, reliable the opinions that they found in Twitter or in Facebook, that maybe they are wrong, and maybe they, they, there is something like fake news, rather than the opinions of a human being. So if the computers and especially the artificial intelligence can do that, can control that way of thinking, that perception, I mean, the citizens uh, will, the citizens perspective will change. Uh, and if the computers, of course, well, there's a lot of literature about this, that the computers can measures of body temperature or facial uh, uh, gestures. Yes, that's right, gestures. Um, and they can see if we are happy or if we are about to get mad or if we are just angry. So if they can forecast that and the tone of their voices, they can control us. They say, well, this person is, not, is going to get mad, so remove from the school because he's going to commit a crime or do something else. So um, that, that's my, my understanding so far. I mean, it, it could change, of course. But at this point, I think that that is. I don't know if there is more questions there. Uh, there was somebody else, but I missed. In the... Yes, I, I have a question, Rodrigo Renata. Oh, hi, Renata. Yes, please. Go ahead. <laughs> nice, nice to meet you. I would like to thank the the seminars organizers for having the opportunity to talk to you and to listen to your talk. Thank you very much. And and my question has a lot to do with Alexandri's question uh, before, and. In, Inside this governance model that you, you talked to us today, uh, there are two topics that interest me uh, personally. One of them is uh, the explainable AI. That's uh, mm -hmm. a, a very hot topic. I'm from the computer science field, just to, to mention. <laughs> and, and, again, and also another hot topic that I believe uh, it's important. It has to do with the possibilities of giving citizens with the power of using this kind of technology just to, to, to verify and to check out things. It has a lot to do with, with transparency and, and doing their own innovation and doing their own uh, using this data and artificial intelligence as a platform for doing uh, citizenship things. You know? And what I would like to hear from you is what you, th you think about these two topics. Uh, how can we use, for instance, explainable AI inside this governance model, model? And if you believe that we will reach this uh, kind of possibility of having the citizen to to use all this technology for his own purpose. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Renata, for your questions. Well, first of all, uh, from explainable AI, I just jump into uh, the day before yesterday that I read something about explainable AI, so I, I don't think I'm uh, ready to provide an opinion about this. Let me think a little bit more and to know more about this. But the second one, uh, yes, uh, I think that 
the people, uh, the general citizens and the people can have access to these technologies and can develop their own uh, work and their own things. Uh, but again, uh, for me, the, the problem is how to provide them with the conditions to do so. And what I, what I mentioned to this is, the first is to knowledge. I mean, we have to develop, uh, rather than universities or schools, to provide them the knowledge to information systems, to the knowledge from computer science or to data science, that people, I mean, that the students uh, have aware and they, they, they absorb by themselves. Uh, because this is faster and this is changing very fast. So I think that universities, we are left behind. We're, we're, we're changing our subjects, we're, our programs, our study programs every four years or every 10 years. And when that happens, <laughs> I mean, um, this, this is the first semester in my university that I'm going to teach e-government. It's the first semester that I'm going to teach open government and open data. And I have been doing research about this 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So my students are going to start learning about this in the university. So we need to change that. The other thing is that we need to change the conditions of our governments that people that allow people to, to become innovative and expert in the roles and competitive in that way. Otherwise, I mean, they are going to be only receptors or users for, for the computer. As uh, Yuval Noah Harari, I like a lot that metaphor that he uses, that he says, well, we have, we're going to be two kinds of humans. The superhumans, those superhumans are the people that are going to program the other humans. And the second is the humans, the normal human, the people that are going to be programmed program that are going to receive the program so i ask my students what do you want to be a programmer yes the people that programs or being program what do you want and that's true i mean we, we need to provide them the conditions to to use these kind of technologies because if they are still using the cell phone for uh, looking for photos in instagram or TikTok videos and just for fun i mean we're going to be programmers. I mean, we're going to be people that is programmed by, by Facebook or by Twitter or by any algorithm, whatever they want to do. And they are not going to have the ability to use those technologies to do something different, to do something new, to do something innovative. And that's the key. And I don't know if our countries has that uh, in mind. I don't think so. OK, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, um, you know, uh, I think there are many um, questions arise after this dialogue here. Um, one of that is we have this huge difference between developed and developing countries. And probably it will be, you know, uh, if we consider uh, artificial intelligence, this gap will increase between these countries um, by using these AI technologies and others. So this is something that is scaring me a little bit because we, we see that this, what Renata mentioned about education, about training on, 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 on ICT and, and others, is something that we really see uh, not only in, in developing countries, but I think in many developed countries, we also see these kind of gaps. But uh, probably uh, the training in, 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 uh, in ICT, uh, for open source and other tools that help to be more, um, let me see, participated, you know, to became the technology more open and, and open to participation and transparency, like Renata said. Uh, it, 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 I think it, it will be a big issue in, in developing countries right now. Uh, as you, you, you mentioned about the, the e government, uh, that you just start to, to teach government, uh, electronic government in your, in your university. I, I, I teach as well uh, electronic government in, in, in the master course. And many of them ask me, why, how you, you, why you study that? Why you start to research this stuff? And uh, how you, you arrive on this topic? <laughs> Something like that. Why do I study that? Uh, so, and I say, okay, you don't see what we are seeing around, so all the things are related, and when you, you see that uh, the public sector, the, the relation between public and the private, like Violeta said, 
uh, is, is engaged in our lives uh, every day, as, every day um, more. So how, how you don't see that? So, and, and we are talking, you know, I'm talking with uh, students that are uh, MBA students, like full-time MBA students, so the undergraduates, so they, they have some kind of, you know, training yeah. for, and even that, it, it, they are so surprised to, to, to think on these topics of transparency, of participation, open data, and whatever, all these topics related to government. So, you know, that this is something that we didn't start from the beginning. Uh, we, like, we, I think many times we, we need a, a step behind, you know, to start to, to reflect and see how governance in, in this, in the case that if you want it specific in AI, that's okay, or in, in general, ICT in the public sector in general, much better. Uh, but I think we, we didn't, you know, we need a, a step behind, you know, to, to make the people and, uh, to be aware about this situation and how this the go electronic government and other things are related to our lives and to society and how it interfere in the, the business as well, in, in, in commerce, you know? So I think the, many times the people don't see the, the whole thing. So yeah, it's just a command. You, it's not a question specific. It's just some um, ideas that come in my mind. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a very important idea. You, you make me reflect about something that we have, we will have two kinds of countries, the countries that are, technology driven, I mean, they produce technology, they make the inventions, they make the software, and countries that are consumer technology. And maybe, well, I can talk about my country, Mexico is a consumer technology. I mean, even, uh, even that we have some factories that we do some parts from the cars or the phones or whatever, I mean, we consume, I mean, it's very, I mean, th there is not a factory, uh, an Apple factory here that makes, uh, and a specific branch of cell phones uh, for that. So uh, I realize, uh, as the same like you, that all of this is interconnected. But the problem with e-government, the problem with open government, and the problem with artificial intelligence, that right now is um, is a common. It's so common that we are not aware that we are using technology. Yeah. That we are using technology to live. I was thinking that uh, we, we are data driven also. We are persons that are focusing on data. How many papers do you write this year? How many now, well, Alexander showed my embarrassed <laughs> Google Scholar citation, and well, those are data driven. I mean, what is the data? But I don't know if real, my, my real contribution is doing something, is doing something well. I mean, it's changing the, the way of thinking of the people or the way of thinking of the government. Because my, my, my main struggle, well, one of the struggles right now, as you mentioned, I have we really focus on problems and not in the solutions. But is that um, the open government discourse in Mexico is recycled, is recycling. I mean, everybody talks about open government. Open government is the same, the same, the same, the same. So I call them the industry of open government because they live from open government and open data, but they don't produce open government and open data because they are still in the same situation like 10 years ago. Everything on the data is closed. And you know, there is even a, a movement uh, going backwards uh, in many cases yeah. and yeah. closing data that was already available more openly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Caroline. Hello. I was um, just thinking about what Marie said also. Um, and I was wondering, could we establish a parallel between what we're now talking about on governance? And what we had in the olden days when you think about public policies, mm -hmm. I mean, um, before we had that much technology, we had also um, public policies that were developed inside government and people in general wouldn't participate too much on, in, in it. Could we establish that parallel that is um, nowadays governance? Well, I have not thinking about that. I mean, public policies could be one way to say maybe governance is uh, more polite <laughs> word or a more, uh, I don't know how to say it, fancy word. It would be more like a guidelines instead yeah. of, of uh, obligations. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe to say that, but uh, maybe with public policies, uh, we'll go straight and do something different with artificial intelligence. But I think that now, right now, uh, well, actually we have uh, doing something with technology. I mean, 
otherwise the the pandemics and all of that maybe we're not going to be here talking about this i mean we talk a lot in la case of how to share knowledge with the professors and the teachers and all of that and we never realized that maybe we can do it by skype or maybe that we can do that conference like this one and now the pandemics lead us into this direction and to show how this could be the place and, and we can share I mean, to our students or to ourselves and to share we never think that uh, the conferences that we missed the the contact the personal but we can share knowledge uh, online without expending so much money or without that uh, so the same thing can occur with artificial intelligence maybe in the long run we will use artificial intelligence and we will not be aware that we are using artificial intelligence for many many things but uh, w what we don't want to happen is that what is happening right now with the pandemics that we release all our health data to the government by the excuse of uh, the pandemics and we don't know what they are doing with all of our data and they are doing with uh, a lot of algorithms artificial intelligence databases without restrictions without nothing without a framework that integrates the data the rules the development and all of that and this idea tries to figure it out in an holistic perspective uh, i mean that's that's a challenge i mean it's not the only one we can go step by step but i, I think that we can provide something for the uh, latin america case for the for, for this area I'm, i think that it will be different in europe and it will be different in north america it's interesting, it seems that we all want to use artificial intelligence for our benefit, but of course we're scared of being used by artificial intelligence for whoever's uh, sake or for, for artificial intelligence sake on itself. When, when you know, hum, uh, humans lose uh, the absolute control of, uh, yeah. you know, of our own creations, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that's the problem. Well, the, the thing is also that we don't have to be um, part of this fake artificial intelligence that uh, it's created by the Hollywood perspective and the movies and all of that because, I mean, artificial intelligence, I mean, I think that, uh, I, I don't know, Memo help me, satanizar, I mean, they, they make the devil of the artificial intelligence. I mean, artificial demonized, intelligence. Demonized, yeah. Demonized. Yeah. 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 Evil, evil. Yeah, yeah. Make evil. Make evil artificial yeah. intelligence. And that is not the bad guy of the movie. I mean, the, it has not even born. I mean, it's, it's just something that we are developing, but many people, many people in the government, in the industry, they think that if we talk about artificial intelligence, it's wrong. It's going to be losing employees, it's, people is not going to be happy. And I think there is no other way to solve the wicked problems, the environmental problems, if we don't use artificial intelligence to find the solutions. I mean, that's for true. I mean, there is, there is no way, if we don't use the machines, if we don't use the information systems, if we don't use the databases, if we don't understand the trends with a lot of records, we are not going to be uh, able to provide some solutions. <laughs> yes, Violeta has raised her hand again. Yes, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, just, just one more, <laughs> just to share one more thought, that maybe AI, sorry, <coughs> could be used Produce more reliable data. <laughs> uh, we, well, we are in a group right now studying uh, how some uh, crimes uh, started with young people because they got influenced um, by people in the social networks, how they recruited people, and especially for the young people. And usually, uh, what they found that usually these young people they trust information that come from people they 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 know or they rely on if it comes from someone that they don't know they maybe they just don't care about the information and uh, we know that young people may be very easily influenced if they they are not very sure about their um uh, their positions right and what i was thinking and uh, on on government uh, is if we are data driven then maybe ai could be used to produce more reliable and good data. I mean, trying to extract what is uh, at least supposed to be uh, more reliable data that could be used by the citizens for decisions, maybe. I don't know, it's just sharing, because if we know that this, because as you said, there are a lot of fake news, we don't know what is true or not if we don't go deep. 
but um, if we can start trying to use uh, technology to help us to find what is good information and what is not so good, maybe that somehow can help citizens in some way. I don't know, it's just sharing an idea again. <laughs> okay, Jerry. Yes. Completely. All right, guys. Uh, well, uh, I, I'd just like to thank uh, Rodrigo for this very thought-provoking uh, afternoon. I think it's afternoon for most of us, right? Uh, I don't know if there's anyone who's, who's in Europe and then it's already uh, evening. Uh, and I have to tell you one thing. Uh, well, uh, Rodrigo was telling us about the possibility of our next mayor being a robot. Next week, we will be discussing what will happen to our own work, right? Because one thing is having the mayor to be a robot, but will we still have our, our own jobs in the future? Fred Niederman, uh, this American researcher, will be uh, here with us discussing how, uh, well, perspectives for humans in this future that is going to be uh, most probably dominated by robots and artificial intelligence. So again, thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. Thank you very much for uh, everyone for being here. And I see everyone next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to see you, Rodrigo. Bye. Nice to see you, Marianne. Memo. Nice to see you. <laughs>